I'm going to start the recording. That's it. No more. Could you move closer to the table, please? or move anywhere. Okay, I'm very happy that uh, you could join me here. Uh, and uh, try to start. Uh oh, stupid me. Okay, I'd like to start by introducing our guests uh, today. We have uh, the authors of the book, Demystifying the Akash, Consciousness and the Quantum Vacuum, a very well-known mathematician, Professor Ralph Abraham, and a very well-known physicist, Professor C.C. Roy, who wrote uh, also many other books. Uh, Professor Abraham wrote a classic foundation of mechanics and uh, many books uh, in a series together with Rupert Sheldrake and uh, Terence McKenna. Uh, Professor uh, Roy wrote a book uh, on uh, statistical geometry and applications to microphysics and cosmology. So we're talking of things that happen uh, very close to the Planck scale, really fundamental physics and uh, the last book consciousness and quantum vacuum is not very well known unfortunately because uh, it's a great book that uh, deserves to be much more known uh, i'm going to ask uh, a few questions to the author uh, basically to improve my own understanding of the book and uh, the digital physics theory that it uh, presents and then uh, mm, i hope we can uh, have a discussion on the overall implication of uh, this uh, family of uh, theories based on uh, digital physics uh, i'm going to summarize my understanding of uh, your work and of course if uh, at any moment i say something stupid or i misinterpret or show misunderstanding of uh, your ideas you just interrupt me and say that i'm wrong uh, please uh, do that because i'm uh, trying my best to understand your ideas uh, i think the objective of this uh, and similar uh, theories is to build a toy model of uh, fundamental reality, which has uh, some uh, concept of uh, the so-called uh, Akashic records, which is a memory field beyond space and time, uh, something of a connected, uh, non-local and holographic nature, which can uh, accommodate and make sense of uh, the class of phenomena that are usually called uh, normal phenomena, and can also shed some light on uh, our uh, uh, mind, consciousness, how it works, how it relates to fundamental physics and how it, uh, together with uh, material reality, can emerge from uh, a fundamental theory of some mathematical uh, structure that uh, underlies conventional space and time. Here again, if I say something which is uh, not correct or not well said, just interrupt me 
and say so. Um, so my understanding of your model described in the book is that it is uh, based on a dynamical uh, graph which is both beyond and before space and time. Uh, beyond space and time, but also before space and time in uh, the sense of uh, a fundamental structure from which conventional space and time emerge. Uh, the dynamical uh, graph is a generalization of a cellular automata. In your model, the graph evolves in uh, a time-like uh, dimension, which is not uh, what uh, we know as uh, physical time. Is a different and uh, separate dimension that behaves like uh, time what concerns the evolution of the graph. Uh, so the graph that you indicate as uh, Qx evolves in uh, uh, micro time, which once again is not physical uh, uh, macro time according to some specific dynamical laws that you specify in the book. As a result of the evolution, the internal states of all uh, uh, nodes evolve in time. They are updated at each uh, time step. And also the links between the nodes are uh, continuously uh, evolving according to the dynamical laws of uh, the model. And once you go through all the mathematics, we can see that uh, space and uh, physical time can be considered as emergent uh, properties of the underlying dynamical uh, graph. Uh, by the way, going back to the image that I have displayed before, I couldn't uh, take uh, a picture of uh, fundamental reality at the Planck scale, at the Planck scale because I don't have one, of course. But uh, the next best thing was a picture of uh, the web as a dynamical evolving uh, graph of connected uh, websites. Uh, of course, this is not the same thing, but uh, I used to think about uh, graphs of uh, networks like the web or uh, in a social network. We are all familiar with the social graph of our Facebook uh, connections as uh, an intuitive uh, picture of what uh, a very complex network of a formed by a huge number of nodes can be. So I hope you will uh, uh, bear with me if I continue to use this kind of examples that are uh, the best uh, network visualization examples that we have so far. Back to the fundamental reality. It's important to note that uh, the graph does not live in physical space and time. It's located beyond space and time and uh, doesn't have a built-in uh, metric. There is no concept of distance between two nodes that we start with. The concept of uh, uh, distance and the pseudometric space will uh, emerge from the development of the theory. Uh, one important uh, step in uh, deriving uh, space uh, time is uh, the identification of the clicks of uh, the graph, which means the maximally connected uh, sub uh, 
uh, graphs where each node is connected to every other node with uh, the points of space. Uh, once again, the picture that I'm using is a visualization of things related to uh, keywords used uh, to search the web for something. Uh, is a visualization of the interrelation between uh, different search keywords. And we can see here that uh, some groups of very strongly connected uh, nodes sort of uh, uh, naturally uh, emerge from the underlying uh, graph in such a way as uh, even if we don't start a concept of uh, distance, some concept of distance will eventually emerge. And in fact, um, I need to get closer to the screen because the text is too small and the scale. Um, in fact, one other intermediate step is uh, the definition of links between groups of nodes that correspond to the same point in physical space. And these uh, second order links, uh, super bonds, can be associated with a concept of uh, distance that uh, eventually will define a pseudometric space. I say pseudometric space instead of metric space because the triangle inequality is not necessarily satisfied, but a pseudometric space is the next best thing that we can do to arrive at uh, a construction of uh, physical space and time. Uh, now I'm moving on. I'm almost finished with this uh, preliminary explanation. I'd like to stop one moment to give uh, Ralph and Cecil the time to warn me if I have said something too stupid so far. Uh, I see that Ralph wants to say something. Uh, remember to switch the microphone on. says hold control down to speak. So Shishi, wave your hand if you can hear me. No. Uh, I can hear you. Uh, only uh, the volume of your voice is quite low. Perhaps you can move the microphone closer to your mouth. No, now we hear nothing. I think the best thing, if you choose to have the microphone always on, that by right clicking the microphone. No. I cannot not. listen to anything. Yeah, yeah, okay. No sound is coming. Yes, 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 we hear you loud and clear. Not now, too. You are silent again. We are not hearing you. No. I cannot hear. I cannot listen anything. Let's keep things as simple as they can. I suggest that you keep your microphone always on. Okay. 
right click the microphone and choose on full time. Okay. Uh, now, now it looks like uh, the system is hearing me, so probably you are also. Yes. She, she is nodding yes. Julio, you yes, hear me? Yes, we have. We have seen yeah. you loud and clear. You loud and clear. Okay, I, I'm in, in awe of your understanding of our model, Julio. You have expressed it uh, much better than I have. I think uh, the book is a little thin, and if it were thicker, maybe it could have a more complete explanation of uh, the difference between micro-time and, and uh, ordinary time and space-time. Uh, but that actually, this is a rather difficult uh, point to explain. Sometimes in the history of physics, there has been appeal to two-dimensional time or complex time, and, and uh, this might be a, a way of making the relationship between these times more explicit. Anyway, you've done a great job of explaining our model. Uh, go ahead, Shishi. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, uh, great job by Samara. I made points of our book. We did not explain it in detail. I'm very thankful. And uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, there is a very small uh, 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 so how, so how from a distance structure, you can the usual and the big benefit you are working in particular and I are working in another direction for statistical geometry. So ultimately, so ultimately we use the thing about the Ralph one more. Uh, we have not very well because we have from Ralph Michael. So Ralph, oh. so, so, Ralph switch off you your microphone. And uh, now I'm also going to switch off mine. And then uh, CC will speak again. I'm sorry, you will have to say again the things that you said in the last minute. Okay, he has uh, disappeared for a while, uh, but in fact, I want to go back to one of the points that uh, uh, Ralph was making about the book. Uh, yes, the book is actually very thin. There are two different versions of the book. One is available online. It can be downloaded from uh, uh, ResearchGate. Then there is also a paper version of the book which uh, is not identical to the downloadable version uh, because uh, is a little bit more complete. I can see that something has been uh, added to the book between the electronic version and uh, the printed one. Now, the thing is that uh, the book is not very well done because I'm going to show you something that there are some pages that uh, are uh, uh, very readable, like this, but there are some other pages where the text is far too light and uh, it's quite difficult to read that. 
Now, I do not know if the problem is only with the copy that I have, or uh, if, uh, unfortunately, all the copies of the printed book are like that. But, uh, however, I would be very much interested in knowing whether uh, you guys are uh, planning uh, uh, another version of the book with uh, more uh, uh, material, perhaps longer explanation, and perhaps also better typography for the printed version. Uh, okay, let's uh, continue to speak one at a time. I am now switching my microphone off and waiting for uh, Ralph or Cecil to address this point. Uh, remember that only one person should have the microphone on at the same time. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I think Ralph will agree that if we uh, can publish a second version with more elaborations, that would be really uh, very, very good suggestions. What do you think, Ralph? Uh, well, in, in that's a good idea, uh, but finding the time to do this is uh, difficult. And uh, also, the publication of each uh, book has an uh, expense in uh, dollars, which is probably never to be recovered from uh, royalties uh, on the sale of the book. So, in my opinion, it's better to make improvements um, incrementally to the electronic version and uh, calling them uh, version 2, version 3, and, and so on. And these would be available online. And little by little, questions could be answered, possibly as a supplement to the book. Not a blog exactly, uh, but just a text file which is available online and which is uh, updated from time to time in response to uh, questions or, co uh, or comments from readers. In particular about four pages in the print copy, Julio, if you would send me, when you have time, an email uh, in indicating a page or two. Uh, I have several print copies here on my shelf and I would like to check them and see if they uh, are better than your copy because uh, the, the printer should take responsibility for reproducing on ink exactly what we see in the PDF uh, manuscript. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, the printer, they do take responsibility, I guess, because I complained with Amazon and they sent me the money back, which means that <laughs> Uh, I think, which means that I'm not the only one uh, with this kind of complaint. But, uh, you know, in uh, uh, my copy, about uh, one page every three is almost unreadable. And if uh, that happened with your copies as well, I think you would have noticed it. So perhaps uh, is a especially unfortunate thing that happened uh, only to my and uh, a few others copy that perhaps uh, has something to do with uh, storage, uh, quality of paper, you know, these kind of things. Anyway, uh, in my copy, about one every three pages is almost unreadable. But uh, having said that, uh, I do agree with you that uh, it would be better to uh, leave uh, uh, physical hard copy side and focus on uh, incrementally proving uh, the electronic versions of the paper. Oh, so I think that Ralph has gone and pick up uh, one of his copies. So now I will uh, find a very bad page in my copy. Yeah, uh, it's a good idea to have electronic version 
Yeah, for uh, example, Ralph, uh, the page 154 and 155 in the copy that I'm, I have in my hand are very difficult to read. I see that you have picked up a copy. Uh, yes, sir. I <clears throat> flip, flipping through this particular copy. Uh, all pages are perfect, including page 154 and page 155. Okay, all pages have the, exactly the same uh, density of ink. In fact, there was one page which was not the electronic version, page 11, when readable in your copy. Uh, yes, page 11 is uh, is perfect. Whether it's uh, the same as the PDF, I don't know, but I will uh, check after our conversation and see if there is a newer version of the PDF that I have on my computer, which is not posted online. I will post it on my website so that the PDF on my website should be identical to the printed book. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, uh, I'll, do, I'll do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. If, uh, if guys, uh, guys uh, want to produce, uh, produce uh, the next iteration of the electronic of the version, version of the book, of the book uh, uh, that uh, just uh, uh, be so kind uh, be so of microphone off, because I hear the need, then yet another and then yet another iteration, and then yet another iteration, then I think, uh, a lot of people would be happy because I do think the ideas in the book they deserve to be much better known. Uh, I'm going to continue with my summary, uh, which is almost at uh, the end uh, before the one million dollar questions. Uh, so we have left uh, things at the ability to define a pseudometric in the set of uh, super nodes of the space-time uh, uh, graph, which are linked by super bonds. Now, at this point, uh, you guys do one more step, which is to embed this uh, uh, network in three-dimensional uh, Euclidean space. Well, Euclidean, because we are not talking uh, uh, general relativity yet, but that's already a good result. Uh, the problem is that the embedding cannot necessarily be done uh, perfectly. We have uh, a very illuminated, illuminating example in the book. It would be a thetahedral uh, graph of four nodes which can be embedded isometrically in three-dimensional space, but not in two-dimensional space, of course. And following the same logic, especially since we are talking here of a system of a huge, unbelievably huge number of nodes, there is no guarantee at all that it can be embedded in three-dimensional space. So you have to settle uh, by the next uh, best thing and uh, define uh, strategies to kind of uh, optimize the imperfect embedding on uh, the network in a concept of uh, space in such a way as to keep as much as possible of the pseudo metric. And uh, now, uh, even if uh, uh, the method give good results, one still has to expect some uh, imprecision, some artifacts, some uh, strange thing to happen. For example, what might happen is that two points which should really be very close end up being actually very far. And I was thinking of that as a uh, metaphor or well-known uh, aspects of uh, non-locality uh, physics, 
and there is something which could help uh, make sense of uh, quantum entanglement phenomena. And by extension, uh, we can uh, think of the imperfect embedding of uh, the real reality into the, how to say that, uh, reduced reality of our uh, everyday experience to uh, imagine uh, possible uh, frameworks for uh, paranormal phenomena. And uh, you do dedicate a lot of space uh, in the book to a description of uh, uh, paranormal phenomena studied by scientists like uh, Rupert Sheldrake and Dean uh, Radin. And uh, you also give uh, some kind of uh, intuitive uh, correspondence between uh, the occurrence of uh, paranormal uh, phenomena and uh, the non-local aspects of the fundamental reality described in the model uh, without going into too much detail. So that uh, I'd like to come to the end of this uh, uh, summary. No, not yet. We still have to derive macroscopic time from the macro time of the model. Let's remember that uh, the QX graph that is fundamental reality is evolving, but is not evolving in uh, what we call time. It is uh, evolving in another internal or uh, external, whatever we want to call it, time-like dimension, which is not what we perceive as uh, physical time. We get uh, macroscopic phys uh, physical time uh, in uh, the process by some mathematical operations. I think I will just read because this is not a point that I have understood very well. What you say is uh, we propose now to obtain macroscopic space time from the condensation process applied repeatedly to the entire QX object, which contains all times, although it's rapidly changing. We consider a memory device controlled by the cosmic time function capital T between cosmic time T1 uh, responding to network time lowercase t1 and cosmic time capital T2 uh, with its uh, network time lowercase t2. Memory device records all the finite states of QX between network time lowercase t1 and network time lowercase t2 and condenses its uh, finite state of uh, QX uh, states into a space-like continuum corresponding the discrete uh, cosmic time capital T2. Uh, well, since uh, I wouldn't have been able to explain this concept well, I've just read from the book uh, and uh, in a couple of minutes, I think I will ask uh, Ralph and Cici to give me an explanation that I can understand better. Uh, well, I do understand the overall visual. Uh, I'd like to understand uh, also more of the details. However, let's uh, come to the end before uh, giving the floor to our guests. Uh, I have said at the beginning this, that the objective of this study is to build a toy model of uh, fundamental reality, 
with a concept of Akashic records, a memory field beyond space and time which can accommodate paranormal phenomena. Um, and the uh, question is whether this objective is uh, achieved by the current uh, formulation of the model or whether it could be achieved by a future formulation of the model. Uh, one thing that I understand from the book, and I like very much, is that uh, we have uh, both a mind and physics, both uh, mental and physical reality, uh, emerging from the same uh, underlying uh, reality, emerging from the QX uh, uh, graph. And once they emerge into everyday reality, they come up entangled between each other because they are linked within uh, fundamental uh, mathematical uh, structure of the underlying network uh, graph. And, uh, you know, at this point, a uh, question becomes whether this uh, very nice uh, ethereal mathematics could become uh, one day engineering. Uh, you know, uh, by one day, of course, I don't mean tomorrow, I don't mean next week, I don't mean next year, but, you know, maybe in a couple thousands of years, once uh, the science has really evolved much beyond the status of current science, can we use a similar theory to do space-time engineering? Could we ever learn how to read the fundamental uh, network beyond and, be and before space-time, could we ever uh, read it and understand it so well as to be able perhaps to find control uh, paranormal phenomena like telepathy that uh, seem to happen but cannot be controlled very well by the naked human mind. Could we learn how to control that with technology? Again, not tomorrow, but uh, sometime very far in the future. And could we learn how to use this knowledge to do the kind of things that has been uh, promised by all uh, religions, like uh, bringing back the uh, dead to resurrection in a new life? Uh, I think I will just uh, switch my microphone off uh, now and uh, give the floor to our guests. Just remember to speak one at a time. And uh, when you are not speaking, switch your microphone off. And I'm going to switch my microphone off now. Uh, also, uh, no, OK, let's uh, keep that for later. OK, microphone off. Okay, I think Gigi is going to wait me out. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions uh, that come to the foreground for me. And w one is the difference between uh, possible difference between these two models, RR, Requiert and Roy, and uh, AR, um, our model from the, the book. I think that the RR model is intended as a model for the quantum vacuum, and therefore relating to uh, ordinary space-time of microphysics, whereas our model, uh, AR model from the book, is aimed primarily at consciousness. Probably 
the subtitle of the book is misleading. Uh, sorry for that. It says uh, demystifying the Akash. The uh, subtitle consciousness and the quantum vacuum. So I I don't think that uh, consciousness is so much like the quantum vacuum because uh, consciousness space-time is not uh, three-dimensional space plus time because uh, consciousness has uh, to do with uh, ideas which are essentially immaterial and which are in some kind of resonance with a perceived reality in a relationship between the high dimensional space and the three dimensional space even though the times might correspond time of perception corresponds to an assumption of ordinary reality time so it, it could be uh, if you think for example of a billiard ball or the planet uh, Mercury that <coughs> we cannot describe a projection all, all the way from the QX model down to the planet Mercury only maybe down as far as the idea of uh, rep mental rep representation of the planet Mercury you see so there is a world of difference between the RR model and the AR model as there's a world of difference between the quantum vacuum and consciousness so the relationship between the um, idea of the planet Mercury and the physical planet is something that we don't have explained really in uh, Western science or or Buddhist psychology or, or something like that it's unsolved problems with many speculations as to the relationship between the physical object and our perception of it uh, that's just one thing I mean that's a a question to be discussed I I don't have an answer and so in the book I have been very vague about the condensation process and the step by step it goes all the way from QX which is a conceptual model for the all and everything and all the way down to well it never gets down to ordinary reality it just goes step by step into lower and lower dimensional representations of the all and everything that's uh, one question uh, the other one I want to uh, commend you on the idea of Akashic engineering and I think that this could be a reality in the sense of abandoning QX as a model for all and everything and uh, constructing a QX for the representation of a certain social uh, or physical process you see from the mathematical point of view we have um, an imaginary world of models and some kinds of models happen to be very useful in uh, physical science and psychology and, and so on like poinsett topology like Ramanian geometry like um, dynamical systems for the solar system etc among these models some of which are useful in uh, managing ordinary systems uh, real life systems among these models are new new categories of mathematical models never considered before for example fractal geometry in 1975 uh, so recently we have a huge new category of mathematical models which can be abundantly applied for understanding aspects of nature that could not be mathematically modeled before uh, clouds waves the forest floor and so on similarly we have cellular automata 
I think they were not really discussed by anyone before uh, at the time of von Neumann and Ulan, etc. during World War II. Cellular automata are capable of modeling enormous category of ordinary phenomenon from uh, the physical, biological, and social sciences. So I just want to commend Requart and Roy for introducing a new category of model which I think can be very important in the future as, for example, your idea, Julio, of Akashic engineering. We would be modeling with a sub-Akash, that is to say, using the dynamical graph idea to make discrete and therefore computable models for uh, relatively simple things, for example, the entanglement of two photons. So uh, I think that this might be the most important contribution of our book. Uh, it, it's not uh, pretending to construct a mathematical model for the, the whole enchilada, the Akash, uh, but rather presenting a new modeling strategy which can be employed to make computable models for all kind of uh, social networks, biological networks, uh, gene networks, DNA networks, etc., etc., social networks uh, such as Facebook, the World Wide Web, the Internet, and the like. Uh, th this could be, uh, well, it could be a subject in a mathematics department in the future, or like chaos theory, it might be ignored in the future. So uh, these are the uh, <coughs> the two things, uh, the comments or questions I wanted to bring to the foreground from your wonderful description of our book, Julio. One is, <coughs> a consciousness and ordinary reality are far apart and connected in ways that we don't yet understand. And the other is that the, this dynamical uh, graph or cellular network uh, is a modeling strategy that could be employed very well in uh, in, the, in the sciences today. Shishi. Hi. Uh, yeah, Raul. But uh, the questions which uh, really puzzled me for a long time that uh, even if you consider Einstein theory of spatial relativity and four-dimensional space, there is no concept of usual time in four-dimensional space. But when we want to measure anything, observe anything in the physical world, then you need to consider kind of three-dimensional space or one-dimensional time. So the question is, the experience or consciousness may require a higher dimension of space-time. And our daily experiences, or like any kind of observation, that is in the projection of that dimension into three dimension space or one dimension time. So I don't know whether uh, it's in a, any scientific theory, whether we can develop a kind of measurement or engineering procedure in higher dimensional space. Because in all meditative or mystic experiences, you have kind of higher dimensions, which we do not, we are not able to do in modern physics yet. So maybe Akashic engineering come out someday uh, from proper understanding of the theory of observation or measurement process in higher dimension. What is mean by that? Uh, still, I, I, we don't know, we don't understand. But there is a possibility. What do you think, Rao? Yes, uh, Shishi, I, I think the, um, the habit of making mental models for things, uh, ordinary reality or, or consciousness or a single thought, uh, the, the habit of thinking of these things spatially based on our um, hundred thousand years experience in visual representations 
in uh, artistic drawings on the walls of Paleolithic caves and, uh, and so on. This style of representation is extremely limited, like spoken language is extremely limited in uh, describing things that, that do have uh, very convenient mathematical descriptions. So what I'm thinking is that the uh, network, the idea of a uh, digital universe of representing things as uh, a dynamical graph. Uh, it, it, it could be that the essential ideas have no representation in the space of, of any dimension. Uh, the uh, World Wide Web, uh, for example, Julio has shown us uh, a drawing. There is very nice uh, software for producing these three-dimensional representations of a social network, for example, like uh, Gephi. These <coughs> are convenient visualization techniques that give us a kind of feeling for the network. The network uh, itself does not fit in a metric space of any, of any dimension. There are too many nodes, too many uh, bonds, uh, not satisfying any triangle inequality and the conceptualization as a kind of cellular automata which can be visualized uh, with a spatial representation uh, but, uh, but only by losing a great deal of information and understanding of the dynamical activity itself. So the, the, the mathematical models of Akashic engineering may defy uh, any kind of successful visual representation. I don't know. People must practice with simple models. Okay, I've uh, switched the mic microphone off again to make a couple of comments to the extremely interesting uh, observations that both Ralph and Cici just made. Now, uh, I want to restate uh, then uh, when I imaginatively speculate uh, about Akashic engineering, I'm not talking of something that I envisage as uh, likely happening in uh, a day, a week, a year, or perhaps not even a thousand years, because the core meaning that uh, Ralph and Cecil just uh, expressed in that what we are uh, discussing here are extremely complex uh, mathematical uh, structures in uh, higher dimensional reality that our uh, intuitive understanding is uh, entirely unable to visualize at this moment. And uh, of course I think what happens is that uh, you can only visualize uh, something that you can understand well. Uh, for example, I was rereading the other day uh, Ralph's book about uh, uh, dynamics, the geometry of behavior. It's a very interesting book because you explain a very complex mathematical idea without even one mathematical formula. but a lot of uh, drawings which are more or less intuitively understanding. I did learn a lot from uh, your book, especially because I like this uh, way of learning very much. I want to be able to see things uh, in my mind uh, before uh, even thinking of the underlying uh, mathematical formula. So yes, I do agree. Being uh, able to visualize things is extremely important 
is a, an essential uh, re requisite for understanding, and we are not able to intuitively visualize uh, this kind of uh, uh, very uh, weird mathematics and physics, which uh, is the possible basis of uh, Akashic engineering of the future. But uh, here again, uh, well, even if uh, things happen in higher dimensional spaces that we don't uh, visually understand yet, uh, we may uh, be able to understand them mathematically better next year. And from there will come a better visual understanding the following year. And that in turn will uh, make it uh, possible uh, better mathematical understanding the year after date, and then a better visual understanding the year after date, and so on. You see, what I want to do is going to be an iterative things, but I like to think that sooner or later we will be able to understand these things well enough to be able to do practical engineering based on them. I think if we ever uh, develop uh, these uh, uh, technological abilities, we may be able to do things uh, which seem uh, uh, magic right now, in the sense of uh, the third law of Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I like to think uh, that uh, Ashic engineering of the future can be a magic technology in uh, the sense of Clark. And I like to think that it uh, represents uh, a very good fusion between the East and the West. I mean, we have uh, so many uh, incredible of uh, a thought that have been developed by Eastern philosophy and religion, uh, perhaps without uh, too many corresponding uh, accomplishments in applied technology. Here in the West, uh, it's more or less the other way around. We had done a good uh, trains and uh, microprocessors. So, well, you guys uh, do all these things in India now much better than the West but uh, it hasn't uh, always been the case. I know that Bangalore is now a world-class center of uh, development of uh, hardware and uh, high-performance software, but that's a, re a relatively recent development. History says that the uh, East has developed philosophy and the West has developed engineering until uh, a couple of decades ago. Uh, even if it's not the case now. But I like to think that these ideas of Agashic engineering do represent the ultimate convergence of the best that uh, has been done in, in uh, the East, best that has uh, been done in the West. And uh, I even like to speculate that uh, these ideas would uh, function not as a replacement, but as uh, an extension of uh, traditional religions in uh, both the East and the West. Uh, I think uh, I will stop now before becoming incoherent and ask everyone what uh, you think of these ideas. Microphone off. Okay, uh, Shishi outweighed me again, so I uh, consent. Uh, our book, Demystifying the Akash, has uh, really devoted a relatively large space to uh, Eastern philosophy, in, in particular uh, Kashmiri Shaivism. 
And in my imagination, this philosophy has been developed through a kind of scientific observation of consciousness obtained by meditating for long periods daily in a cave in the Himalayas or something like that. I'm talking about several thousand years of evolution in which one has an experience of uh, consciousness, of uh, the consciousness of consciousness developed uh, like advanced mathematics through a process of devoting a large process of life to the scientific observation, as it were, of the contents of mental process. And uh, following that, to make some kind of inadequate representation in, in verbal language, uh, written in, in book and literature, and so the generations of uh, yogi after yogi after yogi, meditating, observing, doing a science of consciousness and representing the results in the text, leads uh, eventually to the Tantra Loka of, uh, of the Gupta and uh, the later developments of uh, Buddhist psychology and, and so on. So, the more or less the suggestion of the book, uh, in, in my mind, is the juxtaposition of the Eastern philosophy and the Western mathematics of some generalization of cellular automata. That, uh, that, that tries to be a representation beyond uh, visual representation, beyond uh, verbal accounts and so on, of this observation of, of, of mental process. Now I have uh, confessed in numerous publications of my own uh, education through not only meditation, but also uh, psychedelic explorations. And I think the effect of these methods is to open up an understanding of this uh, higher process of mentation and uh, the uh, maybe the uh, achievement of Akashic engineering in future might be uh, taking not uh, tens, hundreds, or thousands of years of gradual step-by-step -step development of the ideas, the science, the mathematics, the literature of uh, applications one after another, but instead have some kind of uh, catastrophic bifurcation of a leap into the future that every once in a while there is a discontinuity of mathematical understanding of experience, as for example with uh, fractal geometry of Benoit Mandelbrot, or cellular automata as developed by Stephen Wolfram. They are more or less the universities have rejected Benoit Mandelbrot, have rejected Stephen Wolfram, and uh, these people therefore worked with um, minimal support or self-support and pursued the mathematics and finally present the very, very wide and important thinking of a completely new vista of mathematics together with projected applications of the new mathematics and ordinary reality. So there could be a rapid development of Akashic engineering that would be achieved through experiments with uh, computer simulation of simple uh, dynamic graphs uh, applied to certain situations, particularly uh, social network analysis uh, and, and also neurophysiology, the relationship. I mean, this was highly suggestive between the uh, very high dimensional or totally abstract dynamical graph of the Akash model uh, and the network of neurons with their dendritic uh, connections which actually do 
uh, fit into three-dimensional space. So the, the, the possibilities for rapid development of Akashic Engineering is, is there, but is probably not going to be pursued in universities because uh, math departments and engineering departments, they tend to be conservative in some sense, that there tends to be a uh, long time rejection of a paradigm shift and, and, and until the evidence builds up and the, the, the interest in applications that might be in uh, entrepreneurial new startup businesses as opposed to engineering departments somewhere, some aspect of our culture perhaps in, in the East will um, make a breakthrough leading to a uh, huge advance in our ability to interact and coexist successfully with our environment. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, there is now a surge of inter new surge of interest developing in India, especially to develop kind of engineering relating to uh, this kind of ideas in the East. Previously, it was in philosophical level. Now, really, there is new surge of interest whether we can develop uh, engineering and uh, maybe Akashic engineering will be developed in India itself. Because, uh, you see, people are now seriously thinking of that. And uh, they have their uh, still the ancient wisdom of thinking Akasho, and which is not the usual space and time, maybe a kind of dynamical network, which is higher dimensional, and they realize it's to meditative experiences. So thank you, Ralph. It, it might be possible in India itself. Yes, well, I, I hope that I... would be, suppose, uh, a venture capitalist now participates here. Suppose one of us is a venture capitalist and he says, okay, guys, that's a beautiful idea. That's a likely plan. What could we do to stimulate the very rapid development of Akashic engineering, perhaps in India? Here is a hundred million bucks. How would you spend this money to make sure that uh, Akashic Engineering develops as fast and as good as possible? Well, I think the traditional means are pretty good. That means uh, conferences, uh, journals, uh, publications, new societies are devoted, offering um, prizes for the best example of uh, an engineering, Akashic engineering application, etc., etc., that um, centering these conferences in India is highly promising. She, she says there is a new interest. As far as I know, there is not so much new interest in the United States or or, or, or Europe. And um, here there seem to be more the tradition of rejecting new ideas and uh, establishment criticizing, especially uh, academic uh, departments uh, criticizing new ideas and being very slow. I mean, perhaps I, I have uh, jaded bitter idea about this because of the history of chaos theory in the United States and in Europe. That there is such important uh, new development in mathematics, starting with Poincaré, let us say, more than a century ago. It has such important implications for the sciences because, uh, and this is perhaps why it's been rejected, chaos theory suggests that mathematical modeling cannot be taken seriously as a forecasting or prediction technology. That it's uh, very good, uh, dynamical systems are very good 
for getting an idea of how complex networks work. But because of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, because of that bifurcations of various kinds that occur when the details of a model are slightly changed, the predictions uh, are not reliable. So those academic departments and specialists who make a living, basically, who uh, earn all of their grants and salaries through prediction and forecasting in the numerical detail, uh, they are uh, invested in the suppression of chaos theory. And similarly to why are psychedelic drugs illegal in most countries in, in the world? It's because there is a resistance to developments. I mean, we owe so many crucial developments in the history of consciousness to these uh, magic plants. Uh, for example, the development of language, the benzene ring, the DNA helix, and, and, and so on. So th they should be encouraged, but they're not, because there is uh, the establishment is invested in the maintenance of the status quo. This is the reason over all these years I've been returning repeatedly to India and to Japan, because I hope that there is a more open mind uh, in those uh, Eastern cultures for the novelties which may actually be essential for the survival of our species on this planet. So nobody saying anything and uh, don't have uh, any special comment to make at this moment. Just to say that uh, I do very much look forward not only to seeing uh, Akashic engineering develop in the East, but also our uh, Western societies becoming a little bit more, no, 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 much more uh, open to innovation, even very radical and uh, disruptive uh, conceptual innovation. As uh, Ralph said, um, perhaps uh, chemicals can uh, had a big influence of that, I mean, in the sense that we have all done a lot of drugs when we were kids. Uh, perhaps uh, we should never have stopped that. That's a possibility as well. And I think that our society should be much, much more open to creative uh, experimentation. Uh, however, I think uh, I got a lot of... Uh, things to think about uh, from you and uh, I look forward maybe to continue this exchange in another round after having had the time to digest and absorb these ideas a bit more. I hope uh, you guys will be open to that. Yeah, thank you, Giulio. Uh, for and, your uh, uh, before uh, stopping, I would like to put on video also the two other participants that uh, have been uh, silent so far. I am in the middle screen now, but I'm not uh, very nice to look at. Let me just replace me uh, something much nicer to look at, which is here. So I believe that uh, Nukur is not going to speak because her microphone is not working. However, Nupur is uh, the main organizer in Kolkata of the conference uh, titled uh, India Awakens that we are organizing on uh, February 12, uh, 2017. And, uh, you know, one thing is that uh, we are going to start very soon a fundraising uh, campaign for the conference. 
we're going to ask a little bit of money that will all be spent uh, to bring uh, people like uh, Ralph uh, Abraham to uh, Kolkata, which cost money. I hope that bringing you there will not cost that much money, Cecil. Uh, we're going to have a lot of other uh, interesting uh, uh, guests with uh, views uh, very different from uh, what we hear today. For example, we had uh, another video of this uh, uh, series last month, uh, Frank uh, J. Tipler, who uh, said very interesting and wonderful thing, but I would uh, say in a completely different uh, tone from uh, today's discussion. I would say that uh, Frank is an entirely a Western uh, thinker, while here we have some kind of a synthesis between uh, East and West. Uh, however, if you want to see uh, Nupur again, you just uh, take a look at the introduction video of our conference, which is uh, available on YouTube. I will be posting this video tomorrow, and I will also add a link to that video and the link of all the material that we are uh, preparing for the conference. And the uh, bottom line the thing that I really want to say is uh, when we will announce that we have started the fundraising campaign for the conference, you please, 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 please donate some money to bring all these wonderful people together in Kolkata. And OK, if you can wave to our viewers, Nupur, I will uh, now put you off and uh, replace uh, you with our friend Lincoln Cannon. And uh, if uh, uh, Ralph and Cecil are not familiar with uh, Lincoln Cannon, then I think I, will, uh, I should introduce him, but perhaps it's better if I let uh, Lincoln introduce himself with the warning that uh, when he will uh, state his main uh, affiliation, you guys uh, may be really, and I hope, uh, favorably surprised. Over to you, Lincoln. Hi, Ralph and uh, Cecil, can you hear me all right? Good. Um, thank, th thank you so much for letting me uh, eavesdrop on your conversation with Julio. Uh, Julio is one of my favorite thinkers, and I've been very positively impressed with your interactions, Ralph and Cecil, with Julio. So it's been a pleasure to listen to your thoughts. As uh, as Julio mentioned, I uh, I have some unusual affiliations. Uh, about 10 years ago, I, with some friends, founded the Mormon Transhumanist Association, which has since that time become the largest organization of religious transhumanists in the world. We have hundreds of members, and uh, just recently I stepped down from being the president of that organization. We elected a new president. I, I figured it was time to um, let the organization grow beyond its uh, founding leader. And so uh, we've been making some changes. I've maintained a, a position on the board of directors for the organization, so I'll be continuing to help it grow. But uh, the Mormon Transhumanist Association will be one of the sponsors for this uh, conference that Nupur has been working to organize, and uh, Julio and I and a few others have been helping her with. We'll be sponsoring the video recording and broadcasting for the conference. Uh, also, I'm one of the founding members of the Christian Transhumanist Association, which is a much newer and younger organization, but I believe has gigantic potential. Of course, there's uh, many, many Christians in the world, and we think that we can bring the ideas of transhumanists to Christians in an effective way and improve the pro-science, pro-technology visions that Christians have and show them that the, the trends in technology and science that um, we're observing today are compatible with their faith and with their aspirations for the future and with the hopes that so many people have and uh, that there doesn't need to be a combative, a combative relationship between the two. So um, 
those are those are the projects that I'm involved in. I've worked with Julio on them for many years, and uh, it's been a good relationship. And I look forward to becoming uh, becoming acquainted with the two of you and the work that you're doing, which sounds fascinating to me. Julio, I see you talking, but I don't hear you. Okay, uh, I had one point uh, to raise about what you said. I mean, you mentioned the Mormon Transhumanist Association and Christian Transhumanist Association. I think uh, some of the viewers had uh, never heard of these things before. And perhaps, uh, I guess that may be the case, that Ralph and Cicir had never heard of these things before. And the first impression of one who has never heard of these things before is something like, uh, but uh, come on, guys, we must, you must be, uh, you are completely out of context here. What does, mm -hmm. what do Mormonism and Christianity have to do with these things that we are discussing? And uh, don't you think uh, that they are not only irrelevant, but even diametrally uh, opposed to the ideas that are under discussion here. Now, of course, Lincoln, I wouldn't ask this uh, nasty question if I didn't know that you had uh, a couple of good answers for that. And perhaps we should hear them. What, uh, I mean, how would Christianity or Mormonism ever be even remotely compatible in a positive sense with uh, what we are discussing here? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'll I'll answer your question in a specific way in relation to uh, your ideas, Julio, regarding Akashic physics. The idea that we could use advanced science and technology to resurrect the dead. In in my opinion, and in the opinion of many Mormon and Christian transhumanists, and in the opinion of many Mormons and Christians who don't identify as transhumanists, there is a mandate among Christians and among Mormons to use whatever means God has provided to us to participate in the work of God, to uh, follow the example of Jesus in the Christian tradition, and to do the works that Jesus did, including the raising of the dead, the consoling of the sad, the healing of the sick. So if we can use the means available to us, which include science and technology to pursue those ends, then we are fulfilling our Christian duty. We are living up to the discipleship that we take on ourselves in our commitment of baptism. So in, not only do we feel that Mormonism and Christianity are compatible with the use of science and technology to pursue immortality, resurrection, uh, visions of the creation of worlds and becoming like God. Um, not only do we feel that those things are compatible with our religious views, we feel that our Christianity, our understanding of Christianity and our Mormonism mandates that we pursue these things, mandates that we use technology in pursuit of creating such a world and participating as co-creators in such a world. So um, it's, uh, it's not it's not diametrically opposed at all. In fact, it's a, we feel it's a religious mandate. In fact, Lincoln, I think you said once, and uh, I wonder if you can confirm that, that if you were not a Mormon, the head to pick up another uh, religion, you would be a Hinduist. Is that correct? That is correct. I love Hinduism. Uh deeply. I have many Hindu friends. I've worked with Hindus for many years. I'm a software engineer um, by, by profession. And as you are aware, there's a lot of software engineering going on in India. And I've had the, the uh, good fortune and pleasure to work with um, Indian Hindus for over a decade. And oh. The, the people that I've worked with have been extremely kind. I've had an opportunity to visit India and to go with my Hindu friends to Hindu temples, participate in rituals at, at these temples, which have strong correspondences to things I value in the temple rituals of Mormonism and in Christianity. 
and those those um, those things inspire me when I find similarities in the rituals, when I find similarities in the doctrines and thoughts that provoke all of us to transcend the the kinds of lives that we've already seen and observed and reach for more and anticipate more and participate more as co-creators with God or with gods. And, you know, an interesting similarity between Mormonism and Hinduism is that Mormons, uh, while we talk about God very often in the very Christian way of being singular, we anticipate that God is a community, that there is a plurality of gods. And that uh, is something that Hindus, of course, have a long tradition of recognizing. And as I read the stories um, from Hindu mythology about the gods, I often find inspiration in them. Okay, so I think before uh, closing this session, uh, I'd like to hear a quick comment from Ralph and Cecilia of uh, how surprised they are to hear uh, things like Mormonism and uh, Christianity mentioned in this context. Okay, well, I'm d delighted to hear about the existence of a transhumanist movement among the Mormon and Christian communities, and I think this is very a um, uh, very good sign for future cooperation between East and and West, because uh, after all, these uh, groups of religious people, when you you make a dynamical graph network of the the, the evolution of these religions over the past couple thousand years, then it's uh, obviously. Uh, an application of some importance. So to have uh, explicit interest from young young people in these traditions, uh, as uh, Shishi has mentioned uh, about what's going on in India, and uh, Lincoln has said uh, going on in this country, uh, I think this is very, very optimistic for, for future. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Julio, and thank you, Lincoln, telling, thank you, Ralph, for organizing these wonderful discussions. Hope we can do it later on also, if we need it. Thanks. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Julio, for uh, organizing this and also introducing me to this excellent uh, software. And of course, I would be happy to participate in a future event like this. Thank you very much, Ralph, and I definitely look forward to organize uh, many other meetings like this to introduce all the speakers at the Fort Canning India Awakens Conference and stimulate a free discussion between uh, points of view which uh, sometimes uh, seem very different from each other, but uh, as a matter of fact, I like to think uh, perhaps are not so incredibly different as they may seem. Uh, now I'm going to close by putting uh, Nobor back uh, video. Hello again. And one thing that I want to say is that as you see, Nobor doesn't speak. Maybe a microphone problem, maybe an environmental problem. Um, but if you want to hear Nobu speak, just uh, follow the link that uh, I'm going to post tomorrow together with this video, and you will hear Nobu speak about uh, forthcoming uh, conference and why you should consider coming, and especially why you should consider do donating some money to make it happen. Again, everyone, and I'm going to stop the recording now.